we want to uh, just briefly mention, you know, what is Zoom Utopia? Uh, last March, we started Zoom Utopia because we were all in lockdown and all of the conferences we were planning on going to were being canceled. And uh, we found that there was an interest in this. And then also the restrictions just keep going on and the lockdown keeps on going. And so this is the fifth time we're doing that. Uh, tonight, we're really pleased to have Matthew Roberts. Uh, Matthew is the minister of Trinity Church York and IPC Church there. He planted that church several years ago and has pastored there for several years. Uh, every one of us at GRUK has benefited from his teaching, from his ministry. Uh, we are thankful to have him preaching tonight. We would point you if you want to know more about Matthew after hearing him preach tonight. Uh, we have a podcast just a couple months ago called Leaving Anglicanism, and you could find out more about Matthew and his background there. So uh, we're so glad he could preach for us tonight. And Matthew, I'm going to turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much for your kind words, Josh. It's been very, uh, very, very kind of you to uh, say all those things about me. Um, there's, uh, the, I, I don't know whether you all read the advert that was um, sent out. Uh, that was all entirely untrue. Uh, I felt a lot of pressure to dress like a quintessential Englishman. Um, which is how I was described. Uh, I don't even know what that looks like. But anyway, um, I'm speaking to you from York, uh, and it's a great privilege to be able to speak to you. And I'm going to speak tonight uh, uh, from Revelation chapters 18 and 19. I've been asked to speak on why the end of the world is good news. Uh, so um, let's start by reading God's word. Uh, so uh, yeah, Revelation 18 and, uh, and 19. Let's give our attention to the reading of God's word. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was made bright with his glory. And he called out with a mighty voice, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. For all nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. And the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her. And the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues. For her sins are heaped high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Pay her back as she herself has paid back others, and repay her double for her deeds. Mix a double portion for her in the cup she mixed. As she glorified herself and lived in luxury, so give her a like measure of torment and mourning, since in her heart she says, I sit as a queen, I am no widow, and mourning I shall never see. For this reason, her plagues will come in a single day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be burned up with fire, for mighty is the Lord God who has judged her. And the kings of the earth who committed sexual immorality and lived in luxury with her will weep and wail over her when they see the smoke of her burning. They will stand far off in fear of her torment and say, Alas, alas, you great city, you mighty city, Babylon, for in a single hour your judgment has come. And the merchants of the earth weep and mourn for her since no one buys their cargo anymore. Cargo of gold, silver, jewels, pearls, fine linen, purple cloth, silk, scarlet cloth, all kinds of scented wood, all kinds of articles of ivory, all kinds of articles of costly wood, bronze, iron and marble, cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and chariots and slaves, that is, human souls. The fruit for which your soul longed has gone from you, and all your delicacies and your splendours are lost to you, never to be found again. The merchants of these wares who gained wealth from her will stand far off in fear of her torment, weeping and mourning aloud, 
Alas, alas, for the great city that was clothed in fine linen, in purple and scarlet, adorned with gold, with jewels and with pearls. For in a single hour, all this wealth has been laid waste. And all shipmasters and seafaring men, sailors and all whose traders on the sea stood far off and cried out as they saw the smoke of her burning. What city was like the great city? And they threw dust on their heads as they wept and mourned, crying out, Alas, alas, for the great city where all who had ships at sea grew rich by her wealth, for in a single hour she has been laid waste. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, for God has given judgment for you against her. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, So will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down with violence and will be found no more. And the sound of harpists and musicians, of flute players and trumpeters will be heard in you no more. And a craftsman of any craft will be found in you no more. And the sound of the mill will be heard in you no more. And the light of a lamp will shine in you no more. And the voice of bridegroom and bride will be heard in you no more. For your merchants were the great ones of the earth. And all nations were deceived by your sorcery. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints. And of all who have been slain on earth. After this, I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven, crying out, Alleluia! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for his judgments are true and just. For he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Once more they cried out, Alleluia! The smoke from her goes up for ever and ever. And the twenty-four elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who was seated on the throne, saying, Amen! Alleluia! And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Alleluia! For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. This is God's word, uh, a wonderful, amazing and striking passage. Let's pray for the Lord's help to hear and understand what he has to say to us. Father God, we do thank you for, for your word. And as we consider uh, the, the drama and the, uh, the, the dramatic visuals of the book of Revelation, Father, may we grasp with our minds and know in our hearts why the end of the world is indeed good news. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, Alleluia, Alleluia. How many songs and hymns and psalms do you know that, uh, that, that, that say that? Uh, many, I'm sure, it comes frequently in the psalms. Comes uh, the, the word comes uh, four times, I think, uh, in uh, in Revelation 19. Uh, and so, actually, actually, some of the songs that we sing uh, come from Revelation 19. Uh, some of you will be familiar uh, with them. They make some great praise songs, don't they? Alleluia, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let's rejoice and exult and give him glory. I wonder whether you've ever sung a song that goes like this. Alleluia, the smoke from her goes up forever and ever. I'm guessing that most of us probably haven't 
but that is a praise song of the multitudes uh, in heaven in Revelation 19, verse 3. A great expression of praise. Praise God for the total ruin, the utter destruction of Babylon. That is the topic of uh, Revelation 18 and the beginning of 19, uh, which I've just uh, read to us. And it's uh, it's dwelt on in great length, isn't it? From lots of different voices uh, expressing their thoughts uh, about it. We have the voice of God. We have the voice of the Lord Jesus. We have the voice of uh, those uh, who are mourning over her fall. And we have the voice in chapter 19 of the saints praising God. And it is a dramatic scene. Revelation 18, verse 2. If you've got a Bible, do follow these with me. It'll, it'll help you. Revelation 18, verse 2. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. She's become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit and bird and detestable beast. The, the image is of a great city that has been flattened and is now a shattered, smoking ruin inhabited by uh, rats and carrion crows and uh, and spiders and snakes and, and maybe even ghosts uh, is the idea. And th that is what we're praising God for. Alleluia. The end of this magnificent city. Well, actually, it's even more than that. It's praising God for the end of the world as we know it. Now, this is not because Christianity has some dark streak that perhaps we uh, haven't grasped. Uh, no, lots of people would want to argue that, wouldn't they? But that isn't the reason at all. No, it's because Christianity is much better news than we could possibly have imagined. It's the very best news we could possibly have heard. The rejoicing that erupts out of the Christian gospel is a rejoicing at the end of Babylon. And in fact, those are the two commands that really come. Uh, from these two chapters of Revelation, uh, the command to rejoice in chapter 19, uh, it's there in, in verse 1, it's, uh, it's, there, um, it's there multiple times through it, in verse 3 and verse 6 of chapter 19, this, this call to rejoice. And then there's the call in 18 verse 4 to come out from her. So that's what we're supposed to do, rejoice and come out. Well, we're going to come to those. But before we can get anywhere near understanding what those things are and why we would rejoice over the ruin of a city, we've got to ask the question, who is Babylon? That's the first big question that I am uh, going to answer. All this hinges, doesn't it, on who Babylon is. Now, now many have thought that this is maybe referring to the actual city of Babylon. Um, the problem with that is that by the time John wrote Revelation, Babylon had already been a ruin for centuries. Um, and uh, so some people try to read Revelation, and, and this has happened all the way through church history, have tried to read it as if it's sort of a straight prediction of the last few years before the return of Christ. Um, in which case, reading this chapter, you've got to say Babylon's going to be, it's going to have to be rebuilt first so it can then be destroyed, um, which seems uh, not really in the spirit of what the chapter is. Uh, aiming at. And also it makes it very hard to see how we can do either of the two things we're supposed to do. How are we supposed to rejoice, um, uh, it, given that she's got to come back first, uh, which presumably is bad if destroying her is good, and how are we supposed to come out from her, seeing she doesn't currently exist? And that that isn't a very good approach to it. And actually, uh, that that's a problem with the whole way that some people try to read Revelation. Uh, if you read it as simply a prediction of the last few years before Jesus returns, then basically it makes the book irrelevant to all but the final generation before Christ returns. Um, and since most Christians will not live in that final generation, and since none of us know until Christ returns whether we're in the final generation, what it means that almost certainly the whole book is irrelevant to us. Well, that is not a very good way of reading uh, the book. It's also true that uh, those who try to read the Revelation in that way and try to spot how it's being fulfilled around the world usually just try and identify all the things in it with just things happening in the news right now and look very silly in a few years' time. Um, I, uh, I actually had a, a comic book version of uh, of the book of Revelation, well, sort of the book of Revelation, which I don't know where it came from. I had it when I was a boy, um, which tried to do exactly that. Uh, and uh, Babylon basically was uh, the old Soviet Union uh, as far as I can remember, and, uh, and all the things in Revelation were fulfilled in battles between Americans and the USSR. 
Well, of course, that looks really very, very silly uh, from where we now stand in history, doesn't it? No, that, that isn't what's going on in Revelation at all. Uh, no, the key is in the book's name. Revelation. Uh, the uh, apocalypto is the, uh, is the Greek uh, verb that it comes from. It means uncovering. Uh, it is a book that is about uncovering what is going on in history. Uh, when, I was, yeah, when I was young, I used to love the, the kind of books that showed you some amazing machine, an aeroplane or something, uh, and then gave you a cutaway diagram of what was really going on underneath. So you could see inside the jet engine, you know, where, how all the, where all the fire is burning and the bits that spin and how it shoots the air out the back. And, and you could see the, uh, all the controls and the amazing clever bits and pieces that, uh, that make the whole thing fly. Now, you don't see any of that stuff when you're traveling on the plane, but the cutaway diagram shows you what is going on. So you understand why you're safe to be in a metal tube all that way up in the, in the sky or whatever. Now, in this book, Revelation, the Lord Jesus Christ is uncovering, revealing for us what is going on in history right now. Now, he is pointing us towards what, well, what's going to go on between now and the end. He's definitely doing that. But the main thing he wants us to do is to understand the real workings of the world that we're in. Now, that explains why Revelation, uh, it can seem to be such a weird book. I'm guessing many of us have read it and been pretty puzzled by the, uh, the pictures and the, the, the images and the description of what's going on. And in, uh, just in these couple of chapters, which aren't as weird as some of them, but we've got, we've got a city, which is also a woman, uh, uh, which uh, is also um, managing to sit on a throne uh, while also trading with merchants who managed to speak about it from all over the world. And then we've got a mighty angel throwing a great millstone into the sea. Uh, what, what is going on? Well, actually, when we understand the book is about revelation, uncovering what's going on, uh, it's, it's not quite so hard to understand. It's a, it's a little bit like um, if you try to get a, a, a proper aeroplane engineer to describe what is going on under the covers, if, if you don't, you, if you're not qualified to understand all that, it's going to sound like gobbledygook for you. But actually, maybe it's better to think of it like this. You, imagine that you fell into a time machine and you, you had to explain to your own uh, great great grandfather in, in Victorian times what a laptop computer is. Uh, I'm speaking to one right now. You're, you may be watching this on one. Uh, what would you say? How do you do it? Explain a laptop computer to a Victorian. Well, what could you say? You say, well, it, it, it's it, it's it, it's a book. It's kind of like a book. You say a book, except that it doesn't open that way. It, it opens that way. And uh, there's only two pages. And um, uh, and yeah, you open it sideways. And it, it's not actually made of paper or, or card or, or board. No, the, but the top half is kind of like paper. Um, uh, in that it's got a picture on it, except the, the picture on it and the writing on it changes. Um, uh, and on some of the laptops, you can touch it and write on it, uh, but with your finger, not with a pen. Uh, and then that, that's the top bit, which is this sort of paper, but not paper. And then the bottom bit is a, is a keyboard. Oh, no, hold on. No, you don't know what that is. Um, well, it has lots of keys. Oh, no, no, sorry. No, not what you think are keys. Uh, they're more like buttons. And, no, no, they're not like what you think are buttons. <laughs> Uh, they're, they're like little blocks of wood, I suppose, except they're not made of wood. They're made of plastic. But you don't know what plastic is. So it's a kind of substance like wood, but it's smooth and black. And when you press the button that isn't a button, which we call a key, though it isn't a key, then writing appears on the paper that isn't paper. And, uh, and OK, you get my impression, idea, don't you? OK, when you're trying to explain something to someone who has no categories to understand it, it's going to sound pretty weird. Now, when God uncovers, what is really going on in this world, in this universe, in the heavens and in the depths, so that we can see some glimpse of the actual workings of history, he is revealing to us stuff that is way beyond what our human minds, with our experiences here on earth, can really grasp. God has to describe it with these extraordinary pictures as a way of just getting us to get any feel for what's going on. Even though, of course, uh, what is going on is, is nothing really like these pictures. They just tear, point us in, uh, in the right direction. Now, that's all background on the book of Revelation. But with that in our minds, we can start to make some progress in what's going on here. Who is Babylon? Who is uh, uh, Babylon? If it's not the real city of Babylon, which it can't be, 
Uh, what, what, what is this symbol of the city football? It's a city, it's a city who's also a prostitute. What does it rec represent? Well, there's various ideas uh, around. Uh, some Christians argue that it's Jerusalem representing Jerusalem. That is, uh, Babylon being destroyed is like Old Testament Jerusalem or Old Testament religion being brought to an end so that we trust in Jesus Christ instead. So making us basically seeing it as making a similar point to the book of Hebrews, which is saying don't go back to the old covenant uh, because Christ is better. Now, I think there's, there's, there's lots that's respectable in that view. Uh, and certainly it's true that Jesus talks about the destruction of Jerusalem as, as a sign of the destruction of the world. But I think there's quite a problem with it in Revelation 18 and 19, which is that we're told so clearly to rejoice at the destruction of Babylon. But in the Bible, the destruction of Jerusalem is something that the Lord Jesus weeps over. Indeed, it's always a matter of mourning. The unbelief of so much of Israel is something that we as Christians should mourn over, not something we would ever want to rejoice over. So I think it's very hard uh, to read it um, that way. Now, others think that Babylon here represents the city of Rome. Um, and that would mean it's either talking about the fall of the Roman Empire in the fifth century AD, or, or it could be about the, uh, the Reformation a thousand years later with the Roman church um, falling, at least in some places. Um, now, I think there's slightly more to it, more to that. In chapter 17, Babylon's described as sitting on seven hills and Rome is built on seven hills. Um, but I still don't think it'll do. You see, this event, the fall of Babylon, is is about something more than the fall of one city or one institution. Because it, the way it's described, and now let's get down to the text, it is, is too general. Look at chapter 18, verse 3. All nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. The kings of the earth have committed immorality uh, with her. That, that's pretty general. And then we get verse 9 of chapter 18 says the same uh, thing again. And then verse 11, it's the merchants of the earth who are mourning over this. In verse 17, it's all shipmasters and seafaring men, sailors and all whose trade is on the sea. It, it, this is a bit too big. OK, the Roman Empire was a big deal, but it certainly wasn't all the seafarers of the world who traded with her. It wasn't all the merchants. It wasn't all the kings. No, that this is something bigger than that, something that the Roman Empire, I think, was a uh, an example of or a, a manifestation of. But it's much bigger than that. Now, what Babylon means, I think, is this. It's the way that human sin is embedded in powerful structures of greed, oppression, wickedness and immorality. Now, why, why do I think that? Well, uh, Revelation is a book that constantly is alluding to Old Testament uh, Old Testament things, and there's no exception here. So lots of the language about Babylon here is drawn from Ezekiel 26, talking about the city of Tyre. That's another reason why it isn't just about Babylon. John, as he writes, is gathering together uh, lots of Old Testament threats. And Tyre was the trading empire, which was the epitome of greed and therefore cruelty. Uh, then he's also obviously referring to Babylon herself. What, what, when Babylon had long before John been a, a powerful empire, what had it done? Well, it, it had in about 600 years before destroyed the people of Israel in the most desperately cruel manner possible. With men slaughtered and women raped and children enslaved. The city of Jerusalem crushed and looted and burnt. We're told that the Babylonians captured the king of Judah, King Zedekiah, and uh, they made him watch while they slaughtered his sons in front of his eyes. And then they gouged out his eyes immediately afterwards so that that horrific sight was the last thing he would ever see. You see, Babylon stands for the hideous realities of human nature. And that's why Babylon's being used here. It's for the way that power is in or e human evil is embedded in powerful structures, powerful structures that uh, that crush and destroy people, powerful structures of evil that destroy human life uh, in every way. Every time a child is beaten or a, a woman is abused or a worker is underpaid, a family goes hungry, a slave feels the whip of his master across his back. Every time a husband or wife is betrayed, every time 
some fat cat is enjoying himself on the back of the sweat and pain and suffering and death of those he exploited. The cruel destructions of war and the callous disregard for life that go along with it. That, that is what Babylon is expressing. Now, Babylon here is, is interesting, isn't it? That it's not just a trading empire, not just a city, not just something which crushes people by its greed. Or that's very strong in this chapter, isn't it? Um, uh, but uh, but interestingly, it's linked here with lust, with immorality. She's not only a city, she is a prostitute. And because in the background of all of this, there is another Bible passage, not just Tyre from Ezekiel, not just Babylon from the days of the exile, but the Tower of Babel right back in Genesis 11. And there, what was the evil of Babel? Very simply, it was people deciding that they could build their own heaven, that they could be God without God. That's almost certainly um, alluded to in chapter five, verse 18, where it says our sins are heaped as high as heaven. Uh, the Greek word that John uses um, literally means stuck together uh, uh, as high as heaven, which is probably an allusion to the fact that they used bitumen for mortar uh, in uh, in the Tower of Babel story. You see, human evil is not simply located in the structures of greed and power and political uh, influence and uh, an economic might. Uh, no, it, you, you find it there, but it is driven by the human desire to worship ourselves. It's the driven by our desire for greatness and glory and pleasure. It's driven by our refusal to worship the living God. And so that is why Babylon is described here in the way she is, as being powerful. It's the nature of economic domination. Do you notice that? It's very contemporary, isn't it? Verse 16, alas for the great city that was clothed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, adorned with jewels and loads about this. And then we had all the trading in verses 11 and 12. It's really hard to avoid trading with Babylon if you want to trade at all. That's the picture. Because economic muscle is huge. We know that in our world, don't we? Very hard to resist the power of the mega corporations uh, and the rich nations on Earth. But not only is she powerful, but she is cruel, incredibly cruel. Did, did you see how the list of things that she trades in in verses 12 and 13 starts beautiful uh, and uh, continues to be lovely. But towards the end, it just starts to get a bit darker. As it trades in food, some are missing out on food to trade in horses and chariots. Well, this isn't talking about horses and chariots used for fun. This is about weapons, trading in arms. And then, of course, it ends with slaves, human souls. Notice how Christianity has always been against slavery. There is a cruelty to the power of human sin. But also, not only is she powerful and cruel, she is incredibly alluring, is Babylon. This is the most disturbing thing. She's not only a city. Not, 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 not described as a king, although she does think she's a queen. No, she's a prostitute and she's not a cheap whore. She is a very high class call girl. It's clearly stated in verse three and verse nine. The kings of the earth have committed immorality with her. You see, her power and her cruelty are driven by the longings and the lusts of the human heart. And this is why we should find Babylon quite disturbing as an image. You see that the description that she has here, and it matches the description of sin all through the Bible, will not allow us simply to point a finger at those guys over there. They are Babylon. They're the bad guys. No, you see, the root of the evil that Babylon expresses is in the wicked desires of our hearts, we all feel her tug, her pull. Money and sex are a potent combination. We know that's true. 
when used for evil, they're very powerfully linked, but it, but it isn't just sex. Well, I think that's definitely there as well. It's all of our lusts, our desire for, for ease and for wealth and for pleasure and for importance uh, and for, 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 for somehow advancing ourselves in one way or another. You see, the forces of evil oppress us, but they also draw us in. They're disastrous for us, but they're very alluring. The powers we complain about are still the ones that we support. You know, even in small ways, that's true. We all loathe Amazon, don't we? But we still shop there. Uh, and we wish what's on TV was cleaner, but we don't stop paying our subscriptions. You see, Babylon is this evil manifestation of human power on a very grand scale, but she draws her power from the sinful hearts of all of us. Now, what should we then think of Babylon? She should horrify us, partly because we feel her draw and her power. But the news of Revelation 18 and 19, indeed the news, of course, of the whole Bible, but here is how it's expressed here, is Babylon has fallen. Babylon has fallen. This monstrous, malign force for wickedness, which inhabits and dominates humanity, has been defeated. It's the point of the whole chapter, isn't it? That's the announcement. That is the Christian message, really. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. Evil is defeated. The cruelty and injustice and exploitation and immorality and, and all of the vast complexity and power of human wickedness has been brought to an end. Jesus Christ has done it. His victory is won. We do not need to suffer under the cruel miseries of Babylon any longer. And we do not need to remain vulnerable to her temptations. No, she is now a shattered ruin. Verse 1, chapter 18. She is burning and smoking in verse 18. Laid waste in verse 19. Her end is complete and total. That's the point of verses uh, 21 to 23, which just really lays on thick. There is nothing happening in her anymore. And particularly, she has no future. That's what, why it even includes the voice of bridegroom and bride will be heard in you no more. That there's no more children of Babylon coming. Now, this is the good news, and it's emphasised how sudden it is. Did you see this? Verse 8. Her plagues will come in a single day. Verse 10. Alas, alas, you great city, you mighty city Babylon, for in a single hour your judgment has come. Verse 17. It said again, in a single hour all this wealth has been laid waste. And again in verse 19, in a single hour she has been laid waste. Her end has just come just like that. It's got dramatically demonstrated with this, uh, this vision in verse 21. A mighty angel taking up a stone like a great millstone and throwing it, hurling it into the sea. And you can picture that. You can hear the splash as it goes in. And of course, a millstone will sink to the bottom, never to be seen again. End of the verse. Thrown down with violence will be found no more. Now, um, John knows his history. Uh, historically, Babylon uh, was indeed destroyed in a single day uh, by the Persians. That's uh, quite a famous uh, story from ancient history. Uh, there was a feast going on. It's actually recorded this in, um, or at least the other side of the story is recorded in Daniel chapter five, uh, where Belshazzar is having his feast. And while the Babylonians are feasting, the Persians, uh, with great cunning, diverted the river that ran through the center of Babylon. Um, and, uh, and crept in along the riverbed, and so were able to occupy all of the outer part of the city inside the city walls, while the nobles were feasting in the palaces and knew nothing about it. And we're told in Daniel 5, that very night, Darius the Mede was slain. He's feasting one moment, an hour later, bang, he's dead. He did not know it was coming. In a single hour she fell, and so it will be for the evil world system that Babylon represents in Revelation. D 
destroyed in a single hour. There's two parts to this. She will be destroyed in a single hour, a single day. We, we really need to know this, don't we? There is a day coming, indeed an hour coming, when the Lord Jesus Christ will return from heaven and in a moment, with the sound of the trumpet and a word of the returning Lord Jesus, King Jesus, all of the forces of evil in this world will be finished. And the things that look to us to be so huge, so undefeatable, so vast and so much bigger than the rather small and pathetic thing that is the Christian church, that, that they will be gone. They will be gone. All, all of the fear that we have of her oppression, and maybe we're feeling that more than we have for a few years, it'll be gone. Those who hate Christianity in high places will be gone. And all of the allure which Babylon has as we you know, see our children and our colleagues deceived and seduced by her all the time, we feel the pull of it ourselves, it will be gone. Brothers and sisters, this is wonderful, wonderful news. Babylon will be destroyed in a single hour. Uh, the mighty angel in verse 21 is probably a representation of Jesus himself. He will have no more trouble bringing an end to all of the evils of this world than in this vision. The angel has trouble throwing the millstone into the sea. All gone. Verse 20, in some ways, of chapter 18, is a summary of the heart of this. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, for God has given judgment for you against her. It will all be gone. The weeping will be gone. The mourning will be gone. The pain will be, go will be gone. The struggle will be finished. The suffering will be ended. She will be destroyed in a single day. But I said there were two parts of this. She will be destroyed in a single day, a single hour, because she has already been destroyed in a single day, in a single hour. The uh, Revelation is very happy to kind of talk in the past tense for things that, well, they are, it is in the future. And yet, actually, this destruction of Babylon has already happened. She's been destroyed in a single hour at the cross of Jesus Christ. And as Jesus died on the cross, there he dealt with the taproot that feeds the entire ecosystem of evil that Babylon represents. He's dealt with and defeated the darkness of all human power structures, all of the greed, all of the lust. And all of the ways that those things are represented in uh, the things which dominate human society and cause such grief and suffering uh, and, uh, and celebrate evil in such terrible ways. And they have all been dealt with at the cross because Jesus has, has dealt with the darkness of the human heart for all those who are his. He has paid the punishment of all the sins of his people. He has evacuated the accusations of the devil against all who are in Christ. He has taken away our guilt and he has purified our hearts. He has put to death the sinful nature. And in his resurrection, he has guaranteed the remaking of all things. Babylon will be destroyed in a single hour because she has already been destroyed. You see, this is the book of Revelation. It is uncovering what is going on. And as, uh, as uh, the, the Lord Jesus, for John's eyes and therefore for ours, takes away the covers, what we can see is, is that the world that terrifies us and seduces us is already finished. Her ruin was already accomplished. In John's day, just as it is now, it just waits to be enacted and finalised when Christ returns. But it is already so certain. Because it has already been done now, that this is what the Christian gospel is, isn't it? It's amazing how easily Christians undersell the gospel. Amazing how uh, e easily Christians uh, undersell the gospel. Uh, amazing how we, we can talk about being a Christian as if it's something 
that makes life nicer a bit. Um, now that, that's true, it does. But, but that's hardly expressing the magnitude of what the gospel is about. It's amazing that we can uh, we can describe the Christian gospel as if it's a sort of private contract between me and God. It's a it's a way that I can get to know God again. Well, well it is that, but that massively undersells it. Now, Jesus describes the gospel as the kingdom of God is at hand. That is the re-established reign of God through His King, His Son, Jesus Christ. To be a Christian is to know that Babylon is finished, is finished and therefore will be finished. And knowing that to side with the victorious Jesus Christ in the knowledge that this world, as we know it, is coming to an end. Babylon has fallen. Now then, what should we do with all this? What should we do with all this? Well, I said right at the beginning, there are two things that we are called to do. They are to rejoice and to come out. Let's look at those. Rejoice. That's where we started, isn't it? Rejoice. Alleluia. Alleluia. Uh, four times in chapter 19. Rejoice. Alleluia. The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. The ruin of Babylon is an eternal ruin. And the idea that some people have that in, uh, in, in, in the new creation, uh, we're going to look back and feel sad that this, this world has been, as we know it, has been brought to an end. Uh, it completely fails to understand the gospel. The rising smoke of Babylon is an eternal source of praise for the people of God in the new creation. We will praise him for it because it will be an eternal demonstration, an eternal reminder that God has triumphed over and crushed all that is evil and wicked and, and awful in this world. What could there be to celebrate more than that? And we love to celebrate when bad things finish, don't we? You know, we're just think if, if we ever defeat COVID, whatever that will mean, uh, but certainly if, you know, when, when the lockdowns are finally over, we're going to be celebrating lots, aren't we? Of course we are. And if we could annihilate this thing, whether we will or not, wouldn't we celebrate? What, what about the celebrations of VE Day? The Third Reich was finally finished. Of course we celebrate, but it's going to be a million times greater than that. It will be the end of all evil. No more will children be born into misery or, or, or snuffed out in the womb. No more will women be abused or innocent men be crushed and condemned. And no more will some go hungry while, while evil men prosper. No more will wickedness and blasphemy be exalted while righteousness is despised. No more will disabilities cripple and cancers kill. No more weeping at parents' graves or parents weeping at their children's graves. No, it, it will all be finished. And the smoke from her will go up forever and ever. Although actually that is not the end of the celebration. Like in the best war stories, the war ends and what follows is a wedding. That's where we end at, uh, at the end of our reading in, in chapter 19, verse 7. Let us rejoice and exult and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come. In praise of the horrible combination of allure and cruelty, which is the whore of Babylon. In place of that, of her, will be the marriage of the Lamb. The people of Jesus Christ finally being united with him forever. And I think we're supposed to compare in our minds the gaudy debauchery of Babylon's clothing in chapter 18 with 19 verse 8, the fine linen, bright and pure, which she's been granted to clothe herself with. A marriage feast, this is going to be, which will go on forever and ever, in which the groom is the Lord Jesus Christ. And the bride, glowing with delight at his side, will be us. Those who have known him and trusted him and served him. Those who've suffered with him at the hands of Babylon. Now, if that isn't a hope which will sustain us in difficult times, I don't know what is. Brothers and sisters, we should rejoice in the knowledge that Babylon has been defeated and her Final defeat is certain. Rejoice. But then 
we must come out from her. That's 18, verse 4. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people. It's a, it's a voice from heaven. It's God, God's voice, presumably. Uh, that's what we're supposed to think. It's a voice calling us to come out of Babylon. The city has fallen. She's doomed. So get out now. Uh, no, it's not a shout of panic. It's a glorious message of hope. He's saying you, you can get out of Babylon. Now, you, this is actually quite important for understanding what's going on here. You, you don't grasp Babylon until you realize that you are part of her. I hope that's kind of clear from the whole combination of power and lust that's in her, from what I said earlier on. Um, and the language here is borrowed from Isaiah and Jeremiah as, as God spoke to the people in exile in the real Babylon in the days when she still was a city. And um, uh, and, uh, and calling them to leave. And of course, they, they could leave. That's what they were supposed to do. And they did get up and leave uh, and return uh, to uh, to the land of Israel. Uh, that's what happened. Uh, but of course, as John writes, he's writing to Christians and it's Roman culture that stands in the place of Babylon. And, and as John passes on this call from heaven to leave, you need to realize, of course, the Christians who are hearing this couldn't physically leave just as we cannot physically leave. Babylon is this worldwide system of evil. We, well, where are we supposed to go? But that's the point. You see, we cannot leave the world, but we can leave Babylon. You can't stop being in the world, but you can stop belonging to her. You, you, you can stop being like her. And that is what it means to be a Christian. Christians are those who are called to come out of Babylon. Every um, spy movie, as far as I can tell, ha has a scene where the, the hero is in a car or plane or ship, which is hit by a missile or bomb or torpedo or whatever, and the thing starts to spin and, and smoke, and, uh, and then there's a big drama, can he get out in time? And eventually he does manage to get the seatbelt off or climb out the window or whatever, uh, uh, and he runs away, and as he runs away, he looks back and the thing goes, boom, blows up. Good job I got out. Well, that, that's the call, is that? Look, you need to know Babylon is finished. If you're a Christian, you do know Babylon is finished. She's defeated in a single hour. Her destruction has come, accomplished by Jesus on the cross, certainly to be applied by him when he returns. And so you need to get out. You need to get out. And that is what it means to be a Christian. That's why the entrance of the Christian life is baptism, which is a sign of leaving this world, of dying to this current life and rising to a new one. Get out of Babylon. How do we do that? What does it mean? Well, it means, firstly, don't mourn for her. There's a lot of mourning in Revelation 18, isn't there? there are lots of people saying, alas, uh, alas uh, for her. I think I counted that three different times uh, with the kings and the merchants uh, and the shipmen um, as, they, um, uh, as they, they cry out. Uh, alas, they mourn for Babylon because they loved her. Friends, we need to teach ourselves not to love Babylon. Don't mourn for her. The world promises us much. And our hearts naturally long for those things. But it's all an illusion. And we need to stop ourselves loving Babylon. We're a wealthy nation. We live in here in Britain. Some of you are watching from uh, other places too, but uh, there's loads of wealth, isn't there? Riches, health, good food, pleasure. And okay, we're complaining about COVID, but to be honest, life's still pretty good in lots of ways. It's all an illusion. Don't love it. Don't long for it because the greed that makes us long for the good things of this world is all part of the power structure of Babylon. So we must abandon it. We must thank God for the good things he gives us. But we're not to long for them or trust them or desire them or worship them. This can be very costly for us. And it's something that is a lifelong discipline. Don't mourn for her and don't take part in her sins. That's also in verse 4 of chapter 18. Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues. Remember, she is a whore. She will try to draw us in. Give us things that we want or offer us things that we want. Sex, comfort, power, money. We must be on our guard. TV, social media, 
Society as a whole is designed to make us long for such things. Well, the best way to inoculate ourselves against doing so is to join in the celebrations at her fall. God has given judgment for you against her. Against her. Let me end. Jesus announces to us all today, Babylon has fallen. The present order of things is passing away. The end, not of the world, but the end of the world as we know it, and the structures of the world as we know it, is, is coming. They're false anyway. They are disappearing. Their, their, their destruction has been delivered and will be accomplished. So now is the time to leave. There are two futures you can share. You can share the future of the whore of Babylon, or you can share the future of the Lord Jesus Christ as his bride. Well, which do you want to do? Do you want to be Babylon's client or Jesus Christ's bride? I hope that it's a non-question, isn't it? A no-brainer. Let us discipline ourselves, urge ourselves uh, to uh, tear our hearts away from the things of this world. To no longer want to have to do with Babylon. And instead to devote ourselves to Christ, to devote ourselves to him, to celebrate the fact that this world is, is coming to an end. Because the end of the world as we know it. Is good news. Well, I'm going to lead us in prayer, and uh, then I think I hand over to someone else. Let, let me pray. Father God, we, we we're uh, awestruck by your words. We're amazed at the gospel, at the the power of what the Lord Jesus has accomplished, at the the riches of the hope that He offers us, at the uh, the wonderful wonderful news, which we, if we're honest, find it hard to dare to believe that the evils of this world that seem so triumphant are coming to an end because they have been defeated by Christ. Our Father, we pray that you will help us to uh, rejoice in that. Help us to uh, love our Lord Jesus. Help us to praise him, praise you for his defeat of them, to set our hearts on his return. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.